Welcome everybody to Facts on the Ground. Today is, I'm sorry, Facts on Friday. Today <laughs> is Friday, January 7th, 2022. We hope you all are having a solid new year so far. And as per usual, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so we're going to get right into it. And Misty, what do you got? Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is <laughs> the ridiculous idea that Tony Blair is up for um, what is called the um, uh, Knight Companion of the Most Noble Order of the Garter. Um, so I'm going to share uh, the petition. This is a change.org position. No fan of change.org. Um, I'm really not a fan of petitions in general because you know, they're not super effective, but they're very easy. Um, it's kind of the same way I feel about phone calls. I don't think phone calls make a massive difference, but they're easy. So I do it. Um, so this is a change.org um, petition. Um, in six days, <laughs> just six days, 1,000 or 1, 15,844 people have signed it. And that continues to go up at a fairly significant pace. Um, it's kind of crazy how fast this has gone. I think it's one of the most signed petitions in the history of change.org. Um, in just six days. So um, this was started by Angus Scott, which shout out to Angus. I don't know him, but shout out to you, dude. Um, Tony Blair is to be knighted with the highest possible ranking in the new year honors list. Buckingham Palace has said Sir Tony, who held the keys to number 10 between 1997 and 2007, will be appointed a knight companion of the most noble order of the Garter, the oldest and most senior British order of chivalry. Tony Blair caused irreparable damage to both the Constitution of the United Kingdom and to the very fabric of the nation's society. He was personally responsible for causing the deaths of countless innocent civilian lives and service servicemen in various conflicts um for this alone he should be held accountable for war crimes tony blair is the least deserving person of any public honor particularly anything awarded by her majesty the queen we petition the prime minister to petition her majesty to have this honor removed and this really is um astonishing to me it's not really because we all know that um people in positions of power protect themselves and give themselves awards and it's no different than barack obama giving joe biden his medal and you know it's all um a show it's a shit show um but tony blair is a disgusting human being um he's a war criminal who julian assange has exposed as being a, a, a such um so it's it's um this is something that we should be actively pushing back against um all the time though not just when it's you know tony blair but every time you know one of these people wants to try to protect each other um this, we have to actively protest against this and actively push back against it um so i hope that this petition is successful um i think that there's been enough public scrutiny and pressure that it's possible it's possible that people could it, it's it's not like it's going to matter it's not going to hurt his life in any way shape or form there should be a petition to have him um, put on trial for war crimes um that would be something i would like to see but um you know we'll take this i guess we'll take this um you know petition to have this whatever honor removed um from tony blair because he is literally one of the most disgusting people on earth right now <laughs> and what this shows is that people haven't forgotten his crimes. It's yes. been almost 20 years since the illegal war on Iraq was launched. It's still ongoing. And of course, it's gone into different iterations since 20 years ago and is in a different iteration right now. But this petition shows that people haven't forgotten the crimes uh of tony blair of george bush jr as well uh the supreme crime under international law which is waging a war of aggression and it's the supreme crime because all of the other crimes against humanity follow underneath waging a war of aggression so at the very least if it gets no push uh from the prime minister or the queen at least it's out there as a document and people have some sort of ammunition to approach Sir Tony on the street and take him to task themselves if they feel the desire to do so, which I hope they would because the fact that this man is still walking around free and still has a huge hand in global governance 
the fact that before that he was able to transition seamlessly into a special Middle East peace envoy is grotesque to say the least. And he should be taken to the utmost task for the crimes he's committed. So whatever you think of change.org or petitions, this is something of substance. It's a good start. And if you feel so inclined, do sign it. Yeah, I'll drop it in the chat if you guys want to sign it. Again, we're no fans of change.org. Um, it's we're not, you know, you know, advocating for supporting them as an organization. But um, you know, and I'm glad that you just made that point that you did that um this at least shows that people haven't forgotten. They're still angry about it, as you should be, but sometimes it feels like people um either forgot or they don't care or whatever. Um, because again, this is somebody who should be uh, you know put on trial in the international criminal court for his very uh, ex excessive amounts of war crimes. You guys, this is not just like he, like a one off, he committed a war crime. This is a multitude of war crimes committed over many years. Um, and this is somebody in no way who should be celebrated or um, given any sort of recognition or um, any honor whatsoever. He should be in a, in a jail cell. Um, and that kind of uh, like, hey, let me drop this in the. And as the petition points out, his crimes weren't limited to the Middle East. He did the citizens of the UK very dirty. His neoliberal policies laid the groundwork for a lot of the destruction we're seeing coming to fruition now with regard to the health service in the UK, uh, with regard to um, a whole slew of economic and foreign policy problems. The NHS is bankrupt in a lot of ways. And because the militarism that Tony Blair imbued in the UK government, in UK policy, the UK is able to spend inordinate amounts of money on trying to start a war in Ukraine with Russia. It's doing that right now. Um, it's actively training Ukraine's Navy um, while its own Navy is falling apart. And while the citizens of the UK are looking daily at an NHS that is uh, becoming more and more uh, privatized, decrepit, privatized, decrepit, uh, unable to keep up with uh, not just the demands of COVID-19, but health in general. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, and again, somebody who should be in the hang, this guy shouldn't be walking around free. And really, um, it, 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 you're, I'm glad that the petition and you just pointed out that it's not just the war crimes, because he was kind of um, labor's Bill Clinton. Um, you know, Bill Clinton came into the Democratic Party and corporatized it and republicanized it. And that's kind of what Tony Blair did for the Labor Party. He moved it away from being a party of the people to being a party for corporations. Um, and so, you know, he is a scumbag of the highest order. And so um, and he like should Bill definitely. Clinton, he has his own foundation. And... Yes, of course. How are you going to launder money without one, Jesse? Yep. <laughs> Um, but yeah, he is, uh, you know, an unbelievable scumbag. So, um, but again, it's kind of like Julian Assange said, uh, you know, uh, uh, an espionage act charge is kind of the true mark of, um, somebody who's done a service to the people rather than like a knighthood or a Nobel prize or whatever. Uh, that's really the mark of a true person of the people because, uh, these people take care of each other. These are all, um, elitist turds who all run in the same circles. And even if there are like cliques within that um, group, they are always going to protect each other. It is a class war. They know that they've been fighting that class war for a very long time and we need to catch up. We need to figure that out for ourselves as well. Um, so yeah, that, but this also kind of leads um, into our next story that we wanted to cover because recently Julian Assange, Julian Assange spent his 1,000th day in Belmarsh Prison. That was on Wednesday, um, was the mark of 1,000 days uh, for Julian Assange in Belmarsh Prison. Um, as you guys probably already know, if you've been watching this show and my other shows, Julian Assange is somebody who had a huge hand in exposing the war crimes of Tony Blair. Um, so that just really kind of shows you the society that we live in, where Tony Blair is getting this, you know, 
whatever it's called. I forget what it's called even. Um, Knight Companion of the Most Noble Order of the Garter. Um, he's getting this, uh, you know, this honor bestowed upon him as Julian Assange is um, wasting away in a high security prison for exposing him. Um, so it's really just kind of depressing. But there is... Um, I do want to kind of highlight some positives from that because, um, as you guys know, I love my fellow activists with all of my heart. Um, I really do. And there are people around the world who have been in this fight for Julian Assange for many years, longer than I've been in it. Um, they've been fighting for a very long time. They've been organizing for a very long time. And these motherfuckers do not give up. Um, so especially I want to give a huge shout out to the people in London, James, uh, Emmy, Deepa, uh, Ali, Eric. Um, I, there's tons of you. I'm not going to be able to say all of your names, um, but you know who you are. You are there um, every week. Um, sometimes twice a week. You guys are relentless. You are fearless. Um, even despite having cops harass you and you have to pretend like you're outside exercising because of COVID restrictions as you're, um, you know, campaigning for Julian Assange. Um, you guys are genuinely amazing people. You don't get near the credit you deserve. Um, so I just want to give you guys a shout out. And this article just kind of highlights a little bit of that um, by Brett Wilkins in Common Dreams, if you want to check it out. Um, After a thousand days in Belmarsh prison, campaigners demand freedom for Julian Assange. Quote, one thing is clear. WikiLeaks has shown the world American war crimes. Julian Assange deserves thanks and recognition for this, not a life sentence. End quote. Um, truer words have never been spoken. Okay, so... Uh, press freedom campaigners on Wednesday marked Julian Assange's 1,000th day of imprisonment in London's Belmarsh Prison with renewed demands for the WikiLeaks publisher's freedoms, uh, freedom ahead of his looming potential extradition to the United States. Quote, journalism is not a crime, end quote, the Assange Defense Committee tweeted. Uh, Hashtag free Assange, hashtag drop the charges. Assange's partner, Stella Moore, said in a statement, quote, it will be 1,000 days this Wednesday that Julian Assange has spent in the harshest prison in the UK. His young children, ages two and four, have no memory of their father outside the highest security prison of the UK, end quote. And in fact, the youngest has never known his father outside um, of the UK, um, which is really just heartbreaking. Um, Edward Snowden tweeted, Shout out to Ed. Um, he shows consistent solidarity with Julian Assange, and I appreciate that. Um, so he tweeted, uh, every serious press freedom organization in the world is calling for Assange's release, and yet the government absolutely refuses to comment because they know nothing they say can justify such a clear act of political repression. Um, and here he's, quote, tweeted, uh, re uh, Reporters Without Borders. Um, who put out a little video, a little, and it's just like a couple little like uh, images or whatever. Uh, the likelihood of Assange's extradition to the United States, where he faces charges of viola violating the Espionage Act that, if he is convicted, could result in more than a 170-year prison sentence, increased last month after the U.S. won an appeal in the U.K. High Court. Assange can still appeal to the country's Supreme Court, but there is no guarantee it will consider his case. Morris and other advocates have previously drawn attention to conditions at Belmarsh, prison's Britain's first supermax prison, where violence, prisoner self-harm, and COVID-19 are rampant. Assange's numerous maladies, um, Morris said he suffered a mini stroke in October, and he also has heart and respiratory ailments, placed the 50-year-old at elevated risk of potentially deadly COVID-19 complications, health experts say. Um, and just a side note on that, let's not forget that last year they shoved every single um, COVID-positive person in prison in his, I forget what they call it in the UK, it's not it's not the same. It's not like a cell block um, ward or wing, maybe. Uh, I forget what they call it. Um, but like his little section of the prison, they shove like 60 COVID positive people in the same location as Julian Assange. Don't think that that's not intentional because it, it is. It is 100 percent intentional. Um, According to the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, Assange has been arbitrarily deprived of his freedom since he was arrested on December 7th, 2010. Since then, he has been held under house arrest, confined for seven years in the Ecuadorian embassy in London while he was protected by the administration of former Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa, shout out to him, um, and jailed in Belmarsh. Quote, the U.S. government is trying to put an Australian publisher on trial in a U.S. national security court where he faces a 175-year sentence and imprisonment in conditions of torture and total isolation simply because he was doing his job, end quote, Morris said. Quote, he received true information about the victims and the crimes committed by U.S. operations in Guantanamo Bay, Afghanistan, and Iraq from Chelsea Manning, and he published it, end quote, as any journalist should do. Um, WikiLeaks then tweeted, the future of journalism is at stake. It will stop. It will not stop with Julian Assange. And they have a nice graphic, which I would be willing to bet was made by Somerset Bean. 
And as I'm shouting out activists, shout out to Somerset Bean, who does amazing graphic work for the Assange movement, all for free. You can download all of the stuff at uh, somersetbean.com. Um, there's buttons, there's flyers, there's um, informational brochures, there's you name it. If you need something for an event that you're doing for Julian Assange, there's your stop right there, somersetbean.com. Um, among the materials published by WikiLeaks are the infamous, quote, collateral murder video um, sh uh, showing a U.S. Army helicopter crew laughing while killing a group of Iraqi civilians, uh, the Afghan war diary and the Iraq war logs, all of which revealed U.S. and allied war crimes. Quote, Julian Assange has not been proven guilty of any crime, nor has he been tried in a court of law, and yet he is in the maximum security prison of Belmarsh, end quote. I'm not going to try it. Hendrick Zorner? Zor Zorner? Zorner? I think Zorner. <laughs> I think that's good. Um, press officer of the German Federation of Journalists said in a statement, quote, the British authorities do not care that his health and mental health are a wreck. They behave towards Assange as one would expect from a banana republic, but not from a constitutional state, end quote. Quote, unfortunately, international outrage about this is limited, end quote, Zorner added. Quote, one thing is clear. WikiLeaks has shown the world American war crimes. Julian Assange deserves thanks and recognition for this, not a life sentence, end quote. Um, and that's the reality of it. So. Uh, we have a um, an event planned. We're well, not planned. We're planning an event. We're in planning stages. Um, we're going to go back to D.C. in April for the. It'll be the three year anniversary of his kidnapping. Let's not call it an arrest. Let's call it what it was: a kidnapping um, and rendition of Julian Assange, which was on April eleventh, two thousand nineteen. Um, so we are going to be in D.C. Um, on April eleventh, um, hopefully in front of the Department of Justice. Um, I think that that's probably the most uh, reasonable, pla reasonable place to go, maybe outside of Merrick Garland's. I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I'll say, I'm not saying we should go to Merrick Garland's house. I'm just saying it's possible. We could go there. He has a house. We could go there. I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, allegedly. Um, so, uh, yeah, we have an action. We're, we're planning that now. Um, we are coordinating with the In the Damn Wars folks. Um, so Kember and Magnus and all of those people, um, we are going to do like a dual action. Um, I love doing that kind of stuff. We need to uh, cross collaborate whenever possible, um, strengthen numbers. Um, so if you guys can make it to DC, start making plans now, um, for April 11th, I will probably, that's a Monday. I'll probably go down the Sunday before, because if you've ever been to an action, there's a lot of stuff to do. There's shirts to be made and buttons to be made and stuff to organize and pack up and all that good stuff. Um, so I'll probably go down Sunday. Um, um, and then uh, I don't know if we're just doing a one day of actions or if we're going to try to drag it out into two. Like I said, we're in the very beginning stages of organizing. The first meeting was just held last night. Um, so we have a lot that we need to, um, you know, work out and figure out. Um, but we would love to have everybody there if you can make it. If you cannot, we would also love for you to organize your own event in your own community. Everybody can do that. All you all you need is yourself, a poster board and a Sharpie. That's it. That's all it takes. Um, and you can be a one person protest. So we would love for everybody to do that. Or you can go hang up flyers um, or whatever you can do to kind of help get the word out there. Um, we will help you in whatever way that we can. If you need help finding other people to organize with, I can help you. I've done that before. Um, if you need help with materials or information or help finding a location or getting permits or whatever you need. Um, we will help you do that. So if you can't make it to DC, try to organize your own event um, around the 11th of April. That's a big date for us. Um, and then also we have, I hate, I hate fundraising. I genuinely do you guys. Um, but unfortunately, um, activism is very expensive. So we are, uh, we have a GoFundMe up. All of the funds, receipts will be posted. Um, all of the funds will be spent on travel expenses, um, uh, Airbnb, like lodging um, and supplies. So shirts, buttons, um, getting printouts, all of the stuff that we need in order to make an action like that happen. So if you guys are able to contribute, um, please do. If you are not, I get it. Um, sharing the link is super helpful. I just dropped it in the chat. Uh, yeah, we just, uh, whatever you can help. I mean, we're going to do it regardless, but it would just really help offset costs for us. Um, you know, we just can't, we can't afford to do it on our own. <laughs> so, um, anything that you guys can do, whether it's just sharing the link or donating, that's super helpful. Um, and we would really love for you guys to be there. I would love to meet everybody. I love meeting the fans in real life. Um, I've met lots of people, uh, over the, or, Last year, I met lots of people um, on the ground, and it was a lot of fun. And despite the fact that it sucks to be in D.C. because it is a very oppressive place, it feels dirty there, not going to lie. Um, 
And despite the fact that we are there for a terrible reason and we shouldn't have to be protesting this, it is a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun to be in the same location with people who get it and who um, have the same mindset as you. And you can bounce ideas off of each other and brainstorm and just have fun. Um, we don't sleep a lot. So come ready for that. If you drink coffee, make sure you're ready to drink a lot of coffee because um, we don't sleep a lot. There's a lot to get done, um, but we have a lot of fun while we're doing it. So we would love to have everybody there. As I get more details, I will update the GoFundMe and I will be tweeting about it so that everybody can um, keep up to date on you know exactly what we're planning. Um, but it's going to be a lot of fun. And unfortunately, we're <laughs> three years. I cannot believe we've been doing this for three years, but here we are. So um, we're going to go make some noise in DC and I hope that you all can join us. So again, go find me links in the chat. If you guys can help out, that's fantastic. And it's again, not just about Julian Assange. It is mm -mm. about Julian Assange, but it's not just about Julian Assange. It's about all of us, whether mm -hmm. we're journalists or not, whether you're somebody who just, <laughs> tweets about their political views or opinions or you are an independent journalist who uh bucks the mainstream everybody is a target now and we're seeing that more and more every day with uh censorship that's rampant across every major social media platform with things the biden administration has come out and said with things that the Boris Johnson administration has come out and said, um, we're seeing what fascism or totalitarianism, if you prefer, looks like in our time as it spreads across Europe, uh, Austria, Germany in particular. And these are all things that Assange warned us about. And I constantly imagine what he would be saying, what he would be able to contribute to the fight. What would we that. know? Right. If he were free. And so anybody who tries to make it about glorifying Assange or. It's just he, one white dude. Fuck right. Off. It's not about that. That's no. an infantile reductionist point of view. And it's a super important cause. I hate to say cause because it's so much more than a cause, but it it is one of the most important causes, for lack of a better word, of our lives. And it's inextricably bound up with the other fights that we're fighting with regard yes. to COVID-19 madness and with regard war to crimes, everything. Ongoing Literally war crimes. Literally everything ongoing war crimes in Syria, in Yemen, in Africa. Um, everything that Assange exposed uh, is still happening. And uh, that's not to say that what Assange and WikiLeaks have exposed has had no effect. It's just that we need balls to the wall journalism like that now more than ever. And so many voices who we could once count on for that or thought we could have really shrunk away from shrunken away from their due diligence so now more than ever it's important to get out there and stand up for assange and yes really demand his freedom and i want to ask you misty because you are really devoted to this and obsessed <laughs> you can say it <laughs> but what's your sense of how this is ultimately going to play out i don't i don't want to <sighs> force you into predicting the future but are you hopeful no or are you just unsure all the time I'm unsure all of the time because nothing in this case has ever made any sense. Um, it's nothing about it is legal or just or fair or reasonable or logical. Um, so there's a lot of um, just never knowing what's happening. And there's a lot of they, they leave um, him and therefore us, his supporters, in a lot of limbo. There's a lot of like right now we have no idea when the ruling on the latest appeal will come down. Uh, we had no idea when the uh, December 10th thing was. It was like hours. We had like 12 hours notice. 
Um, Craig Murray literally had to like run from doing errands to like get on a train to make it to London in time. It was like we had hours. So they're they're very good at keeping us all off balance. I mean, Andrew, as some of you may know, had to step away from Action for Assange and the vigils for a while. It is mentally and emotionally draining. Um, so you ask if I'm hopeful? No, because I mean, look at where we're at. We shouldn't even be where we're at at this point. Um, and I, I hate to be like that, but I'm just trying to be realistic. I don't want to give anybody any like false hopes or anything like this. We are fighting a losing battle, but it is a battle which must be fought. We cannot not fight this. Um, so he's not doing well. I mean, he's not. He, he just had a mini stroke in October. Um, he's not doing well. He was he was already medically unwell before the mini stroke. And so, um, you know, he's not in a great place. Um, we're now in the middle of another winter in a freezing cold prison in which they're probably not adequately taking care of him. He's not getting adequate medical care. Um, he's isolated. He's unable to speak to his family and friends as often as he should be. He's unable to meet with his legal team and prepare his defense or work with his defense team. Um, so it doesn't look good. I'm not going to lie to you guys. Um, it, it We're not in a good spot. But this we cannot not fight this. It's just not an option, at least for me. Um, I'm not asking everybody um, to be as obsessive as I am because I realize that I'm extremely passionate about this. Um, but I think that everybody should be taking an active interest in what's happening in this case and speaking out about it on a regular basis. Because as Jesse mentioned, this affects literally everything else that we're doing. If I mean, you cannot adequately fight fascism. You can't adequately fight imperialism or empire without the ability to spread information um, and talk to each other, have conversations um, and get real truth. Um, you know, we're, we're living in um, a, a time of like a truth ministry. People are deciding what it, they're manufacturing your reality for you. Um, and so nobody has any idea what's actually going on around them and that should terrify everybody. So, I mean, if you're, if you're Antifa, if you're anti-imperialism, if you're anti-colonialism, if you're anti-capitalist, if you're any of those things, this is the cause for you. Um, and we welcome everybody again. We don't care. I, I mean, I can't speak for all Assange supporters, but myself, I don't care who you voted for. I don't care what party you belong to. I don't care what ism you subscribe to. Um, if you're willing to fight for Julian Assange and the future of press freedom and free speech, then welcome a board period end of story no questions asked um so yeah i mean i i know i'm not hopeful but it i if i didn't have like a tiny bit of hope somewhere in my cold dead heart i wouldn't keep doing what i do mm -hmm. so it's kind of a long-winded way of answering but here we are do you feel like the psychological warfare they wage against assange and stella morris assange's family WikiLeaks, do you feel like that's also directed at activists such Absolutely. as yourself? Absolutely. That Absolutely. Especially that technique, for lack of a better word, of keeping you in the dark until yes. at least the very last minute. Yes. And they also like to like throw little pieces, little crumbs, um, which I, I kind of go back and forth on because January 4th, when they ruled against extradition, we all celebrated that. And I think rightfully so. Um, we needed that. We needed to celebrate a little bit. It was something that we needed um, for, as a morale boost. But that really wasn't a win. Um, I'm a big fan of inventing wins if you don't get them because you need it for morale boost. Like you need that to keep yourself going. Cause in, I'm not going to lie in Assange activism and the stuff that I do, at least there's not a lot of wins. You don't get a lot of wins. <laughs> it's a lot of getting kicked in the face. You know what I'm saying? Um, so sometimes you just need like that uplift in spirit. Um, so they'll do like a couple little quick things like flicking some crumbs in our direction. Um, but yeah, it's, I think that it's 100% targeted against the activists too. They're trying to demoralize us. They want us to give up. Um, if you notice, and I've spoken about this before, every time there's an important court date or there's something that's going on in the Assange case, um, if you pay attention on Twitter, the attacks on the activists who are fighting for Julian Assange ramp up exponentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's insane. It goes from, I mean, I get a lot of trolls, right? It's a normal thing. Um, I get a lot of trolls, but if there's an important court date, it is nothing but trolls for like a week surrounding whatever is happening in the Assange case. And that's very intentional. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's definitely directed at activists. They want they want us to quit. Um, yeah, not quitting, though. Sorry. <laughs> but I think that those coordinated ramped up attacks are a sign that they know there's a huge movement 
standing in solidarity with Assange. And yes, you only have to look at the likes uh, of tweets like Edward Snowden's or mm -hmm. WikiLeaks's tweets. There are tens of thousands on average for those tweets from people around the world. And that's with them being like algorithmically pushed down, shadow banned. Like my Assange tweets don't get near as much interaction as other tweets. And that's intentional too. Right. And I found in my own experience that people who are not familiar with Assange or WikiLeaks or they have a a tainted point of view because they've only heard MSNBC's point of view, when you sit down and have a conversation with them and lay out the facts, they turn almost on a dime. And I can point yes. to my own parents as an example, and they are of the same mind that we are. Uh, this is a travesty of justice is a cliche and I hate using cliches, but that's what this is. And, and they get it right away. And I think any thinking person with empathy for other human beings How gets can it you right not? away. It's so ridiculous. If you really point out all the ridiculousness to anybody with two brain cells, it becomes very clear what's going on here. Um, and it becomes very clear how railroaded he has genuinely been. Um, the fact that we're still, the fact that we're even still in this position after the key witness um, admitted to fabricating his testimony in exchange for immunity from the FBI and UC Global was caught spying on him and his legal team and everybody else who walked into the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, the CIA was caught uh, plotting to kidnap or murder him there was like uh, conversations about shootouts in the streets of london um y'all we're really considering extraditing this man to that country the country that was plotting to murder him that alone should have this case lit on fire every one of those three things i just mentioned should have this case lit on fire not to mention the fact he genuinely did nothing wrong he did journalism he did what every, journalists all over the globe do on a daily basis he just did it better than everybody else um yeah, it's it is ridiculous. But I think you're right. Most people who don't have like a preconceived bias against him, who haven't been poisoned by the 10 year smear campaign that's been levied against him. Any uh, that's been my experience too. any person that you talk to. Um, it's it, it's very it's very it's a very quick it's very quick work to get them to see what's going on and to get them to recognize uh, this is just it's insane. What's happening is insane. Yeah, absolutely. And I I share your sense of the future. I try to be as optimistic about it as I can, but if If you guys know me, I'm a cynic. So I'm going I I I just don't want to sugarcoat things for you guys. Right. I'm just being realistic. In my opinion, it's not cynical. It's just realistic. That is the fight that we're fighting. Um, and it is hard and it's going to be hard and it's going to suck and there's not going to be a lot of wins. Um, but in my opinion, there is no other choice but to fight. Yeah, and I just want to give a shout out to the amazing journalists who've been in solidarity with Assange for Kevin Gastola, Mohammed Al Mazi, uh, Matt Kennard, Mark Curtis. Um, I'm going to forget people. I shouldn't have started listening to people because now I'm nervous. So I'm going to forget people. Max Blumenthal, um, tons of people. Craig Murray, uh, John Pilger, tons of people, tons of amazing, some of our best. Um, uh, Rachel Blevins, um, the tons, seriously, tons of people, um, Glenn Greenwald, Glenn Greenwald has been a loyal supporter, um, just extreme solidarity from those people. And that's something that does give me a little bit of hope. I'm not going to say all because, um, amongst the whistleblower and journalist community, there isn't solidarity from everybody, which is really unfortunate, but most people in that community, um, stand in solidarity with each other. Um, Daniel Hale stands in solidarity with Julian Assange. Julian Assange, if he could speak, would 100% stand in solidarity with Daniel, with Daniel Hale. Um, you know, John Kiriakou has been a longtime supporter. Daniel Ellsberg has been a longtime supporter. Ray McGovern, uh, Bill Binney. They all stand in solidarity. Um, and that is, it's, it's nice. It's nice to see that. Um, and, you know, kudos to the people who have been covering this and who have been on the right side of this all along. Yeah, absolutely. So, as always, we'll stay on any and all developments with regard to that. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, you we'll guys keep, know me. That's what I do. We'll keep <laughs> talk about Assange too much. <laughs> we'll keep boosting uh, any events, especially um, 
the Action for Assange event that's coming up in DC. And everybody come. Other organizations will be there as well. Yeah, the end the damn wars people will be there. Whoever, whoever wants to come, as long as you're not an asshole who's just there to like be an agent provocateur or um, you know, try to disrupt the the event, everybody's welcome. Everybody, open arms. If you're ready to fight for press freedom, free speech, Julian Assange, whistleblowers, then come on down. We're, I'm not I'm not gonna stand at the door with like a checklist and you have to like tell me all of your ideological um, opinions before we allow you to come and, and join us. We don't care. Yeah, it's not a partisan issue. No, this Never is it. Has and been. that's something I will say. I'll pat myself and ourselves on the back. Um, Action for Assange, when we first started it, was the, the goal was always to be a post partisan movement. Um, we don't care about your team bullshit. We don't care about your tribalist mentality. Um, it, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what you stand for, who you support, who you voted for, what party you belong to. I don't care. I don't care what books you read. Don't care. Um, if you want to come and help us fight, then come help us fight. Absolutely. And speaking of nonpartisan issues, let's get into some COVID-19 madness um yay <laughs> because it never ends but it never ends where are we going with, first so i can pull as, it up as with assange we have to keep an eye on this a critical yeah. eye as much as possible and pushing back against it because it really is an existential threat to humanity as i think the persecution of julian assange is as well and uh i don't think there's any room or any need for comparisons that weigh which one is more important than the other. I think they're equally important. And as we've said, they're intertwined. And um, it's not about making one superior to the other. Um, you've you've got to fight both as many fights as you can, because there are so many fronts going on here. So um, first, I'd just like to start with this article that came out in the wall street journal a few days ago mm. and i don't have that it should be the first one. Oh, i see it yeah i just didn't go up far enough my bad my bad guys so all right i won't read this whole article because it's pretty lengthy but it's just something i want to point out because when we talk about the COVID-19 madness, we often talk about how it's not about the virus. It's not about health, that there's a larger agenda at play and the virus and- Can I interrupt you for one second to answer a question? Sorry, I sure. don't wanna get too far. Son of Clay, the GoFundMe will, we're all gonna, it's all, we're all gonna be together. So the GoFundMe, um, is going to help all we're all going to stay in the same airbnb we're all gonna so um i don't know if they're running their own funders or i haven't talked to them about that yet but i'm there's no like division we're all friends we'll all help each other it'll all be for everybody if that helps okay sorry go ahead and just a point there um before i get into this with the constant fear mongering that goes on now in the form of omicron and people having to keep apart and the ever-changing mandates that's also aimed at movements like the solidarity movements for assange it's it's aimed at keeping activists apart um so that they can't have uh, a collective consequential effect and we need to keep that in mind um whenever they ratchet up the fear with regard to this so-called pandemic that um, one of the things it's aiming to do is break us up, break up our solidarity, whether it's on the family level or whether it's on the activism level. So, um, just something to point out there, uh, another way that this connects, but I want to start with this article from the wall street journal, uh, that was published on January 4th and it's titled Bitcoin at the bank, mainstream lenders dabble in crypto outside the US. And the subtitle is large banks in Australia and Spain are offering customers cryptocurrency assets for the first time. So we often talk about 
the agenda behind COVID-19 and what the so-called pandemic is being used for. And this gets quite a bit at the end game because if we look at the hierarchy of players uh, or actors uh, orchestrating the COVID-19 agenda, at the very top are the central banks of the world and the central bankers. And what they want to do, um, if you look at BlackRock's papers, publications, for example, is they want to recalibrate, uh, or perhaps a better word is reset the world's financial system to what's called going direct. And there's a link uh, I'll show after this piece um, from BlackRock, BlackRock itself, which explains going direct. Um, I can read through that. It's not a long piece. It's a summary of a larger paper they put out. Um, but in general, what going direct means is um, merging central bank policy with um, fiscal policy, monetary and fiscal policy, uh, to the point where the central banks are con are controlling all of the world's currency, how it's dispersed, how it's used, uh, and tracking that uh, for everybody. And the way they're looking to do that is through central bank digital currencies, which is their own form of cryptocurrency. So um, I don't want to get too into the weeds with this because I've asked Nick Hudson, who's been on the show uh, previously, if he'd be willing to come on and go into this in detail um, because he's much more knowledgeable with regard to the economics behind the COVID-19 agenda. Uh, but what we can see here is this going direct agenda beginning to roll out, I think. And it's telling that it's banks in Australia and Spain, two of the most um, fascistic places right now with regard to COVID-19 madness uh, that are testing this out, so to speak. And you can go through this article for yourself and judge for yourself whether you think I'm right on I'll drop that. it in the chat, guys, for you. But um, the article starts by saying mainstream banks outside the U.S. are sampling cryptocurrencies, offering, offering customers ways to invest and store Bitcoin and other digital assets. And so this ties back to the vaccine passports as they're called and the vaccine passports why we keep warning against them is because they are a gateway into this sort of system where you have a digital wallet that doesn't just hold your vaccination status but it also holds the status of your digital assets as they like to put them um, and not just the status of those, but your access to them. And mm -hmm. that's why it's so vital to oppose both mandates and this uh, push that goes along with it to uh, towards central bank digital currencies, because that in the end is the way that they are going to, or that they have in mind of controlling all of us, those of us uh, who aren't uh, killed off by other parts of their agenda. So this is one of the first pieces I've seen uh, come out with regard to the rollout of this. And whether or not this actually is a sign of that, uh, the start of that rollout, um, it's hard to say for sure. As I said, this is something We'll hopefully get into more with Nick Hudson. Um, but if you look at this piece, there are a lot of hints that this is the beginning of the rollout. Um, for example, it says trading of cryptocurrencies has surged along with their value 
in 2021, the combined market value of all cryptocurrencies more than doubled to over $2 trillion. So the central banks want nothing more than to leverage that $2 trillion, but not for any of us, for themselves. They want yes. to leverage it for their control so they are able to disperse it and monitor it 24 seven and uh, herd us into what they keep telling us they have planned for us, which is this great reset where we'll basically be um, a rentor class, uh, renting everything from them. We own nothing. And uh, supposedly we're going to be extremely happy about that. You will have nothing and you will like it. Exactly. And there's a lot of information, uh, again, in here. So I don't want to go through the whole thing. But one thing to point out here is that last year, the Basel Committee for Banking Supervision, which is connected to uh, the Bank um, for International Settlements, which is the top central bank in the world, so last year, the Basel Committee for Banking Supervision, which sets global standards for banking regulation, laid out a proposal that would require lenders to set aside a dollar in capital for every dollar of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies they own, considering them among the riskiest assets a bank could own. So what that points to to me is that the central banks all the way up to the top are making moves to get going direct going and um they're hedging their bets at this point at this point uh they consider or so they say cryptocurrencies risky but i think that they're considering them risky now because they don't have fully centralized control over them um but make no mistake that's what they're going for and that in the end is what they plan on being um the bars of the prison cell um, of the prison they intend to build for us. So all of this, again, to point out that when we talk of an agenda that goes beyond a pandemic, um, this is what we're getting at. And there are people who are a lot better placed than I am to speak about this. Uh, Dr. Catherine Austin Fitz being one of them, Nick Hudson being another, John Titus is very good, um, Ernst Wolf, the German economist, is very good. I encourage you to look up all of them. They've given lots of talks breaking this down. Um, but it's this move to digitize everything from our uh, quote unquote vaccination status to um, our digital assets. And again, this is how they intend to control the world. And it's not a conspiracy. It's something they've written about. It's there for anybody to find. If you want to go to the essentially PR firm that uh, is promoting this nonstop, the World Economic Forum, go there, read their documents uh, for yourself. Um, they, I love when people try to say this is conspiracy. Yeah, they're on video saying it out loud on a regular basis. Like there's lots of video. There's they've written about it. They've there's books. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is a real thing that's happening and you need to start paying attention to it now. Well, actually, like 10 years ago, but now it would be good. And this article poses this as a, a pilot program. Um using as many as 10 types of cryptocurrencies. And the plan is, according to this article, to increase the offerings and the customer reach through this year. So to me, it very much seems like this is the beginnings of the push toward uh, CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. So something to pay attention to. And uh, if you can just bring up real quick the next link, the BlackRock link. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sorry, it takes forever to do this. Uh, where'd you go? Where are you? Oh, I think this is right. Okay, here we go. Ugh. Yeah. So this is the summary I mentioned earlier. 
going direct, how central banks could deal with the next downturn. It's very telling that the date on this is October 3rd of 2019, which um, is right on the cusp of the so-called uh, emergence uh, of the pandemic. Um, and if you read the brief summary at the top, Elga, who's the author of this piece, discusses how central banks could, quote, go direct, unquote, and use unprecedented coordination between monetary and fiscal policy to deal with the next downturn. This is the fourth and final blog in a series on the topic of, quote, dealing with the next downturn, unquote. And if you go to the second paragraph, it says, we believe policymakers should lay the groundwork for a credible plan to navigate the next economic shock that includes the coordination between monetary and fiscal measures. We lay out the contours of such a framework in our latest macro and market perspectives. Absence of a credible plan is, a contrib is contributing to market anxiety and adding to the rush into the perceived safety of government bonds in our view. So they want to do away with government bonds, uh, among many other forms of currency. Um, below those graphs, it says a practical approach would be to stipulate a contingency where monetary and fiscal policy would become jointly responsible for achieving the inflation target. And if you go all the way down to the bottom of this piece, it says that going direct would provide stimulus without having to rely on rates going ever lower and could help restore a more normal rate environment. And bear in mind that that's not for people like us, us plebs or plebs, if you want to pronounce it that way. This is for the central banks. This is how um, this is what they they are re, uh, defaulting to, no pun intended, uh, so that they can hopefully stave off uh, another worldwide financial collapse, um, which was about to happen before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was declared, uh, when the repo markets collapsed. Um, and it just so happened that this pandemic came along and they were able to uh, basically start the process of going direct and um, recalibrating the world's financial system, which is what they are doing now, what they um, plan to continue doing uh, well into the future. And the last thing I'll say about this is to keep in mind that BlackRock is um, the biggest asset manager and owner in the world. Um, they have their fingers in just about every, if not every financial market in the world. Um, they own, I believe, most of the world's property. Uh, they, along with Vanguard. Um, so they are at the forefront of this. Um, they are sort of the public facing entity <laughs> sorry she's so loud come here jules she, she knows how she knows how she's mad at black rock too y'all <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um i'll just wrap up by saying that um black rock is one of the foremost public facing entities pushing this uh move toward central bank digital currencies and uh, controlling us under those measures. And again, that is not conspiracy theory. Uh, that is they, their publicly stated goal. And uh, their gateway into that, once again, is through so-called vaccine passports, which is why we have to resist those, because otherwise we're going to truly end up in a world where we own nothing and we are reliant on these enti entities um, for even the most tedious things, like how far we can travel to buy groceries. Yes, they, they want you entirely reliant on the state. Yep. So 
take a look at this yourself. There's a lot to uh, Did dive I drop deeper. that in the chat already? I don't think I did. Not the BlackRock one. There's a lot to uh, a lot here uh, in which you can dive more deeply. And if you're not familiar with uh, Solari Report, which is Dr. Catherine Austin Fitz's uh, outfit, check out solarireport.com, I believe it is. And there are really good uh, papers there explaining this. Um, but from the point of view, I'm trying to um amateurly amateurishly explain it right now um to give you a better understanding of where this is all going um so i'll leave it at that um, hi lucky lucky just jumped in the chat and i love lucky hi lucky and i'll move to the next one um so going from the central banks at the top of this uh agenda down to what you would call the um policy enforcers if you will which are the heads of nation states um i want to go to this japan today piece about uh comments uh emmanuel macron recently made regarding oh so gross the so-called unvaccinated uh emmanuel macron of course being the french president this fascist fuck seriously you guys and i'll read through this piece because it's brief um and I bring this one up in particular because a lot has been made of comments that Trudeau made calling the unvaccinated racists, right wingers and misogynists. Oh. And um, that deserves all of the attention it's gotten, but um, this has gotten some attention, but not nearly as much as it should. So the headline here is Macron sparks backlash after saying he wants to, quote, piss off, unquote, unvaccinated. French President Emmanuel Macron on Wednesday faced anger from opponents and chaos in Parliament after issuing a provocative warning to people in France not yet vaccinated against COVID-19 that he would pressure them as much as possible by limiting, limiting access to key aspects of life. Macron, who has not yet formally declared his candidacy for re-election in April, came under fire from challengers already in the race, accusing him of overstepping the line with his remarks. The uproar prompted a new delay in the passing of legislation aimed at tightening France's COVID rules at a time when the country is facing record daily infection rates fueled by the Omicron strain of the virus. Quote, as for the non-vaccinated, I really want to piss them off, unquote, he told Le Parisien newspaper in an interview using the French French verb emmerder. So there's some, um, not controversy, but some differences of uh, translation, um, differences of opinion uh, with regard to the translation of what he said. But basically it boils down to what the headline here says that he wants to piss off the unvaccinated and uh as the article continues this would mean quote limiting as much as possible their access to activities in social life unquote he added quote we have to tell the unvaccinated you will no longer be able to go to the restaurant you will no longer be able to go for a coffee you will no longer be able to go to the theater you will no longer be able to go to the cinema, unquote, the president said. Quote, we will continue to do this to the end. This is the strategy, unquote, Macron added. What he means by the end, I'm not sure, but it is foreboding to say the least. And this is despite the fact that, as this article states, according to government figures, 91% of French over 18s are fully vaccinated. The rate surged over the summer after the introduction of a, quote, health pass, unquote, which restricted many activities to those with proof of vaccination, a recent negative test, or recovery from coronavirus infection. But that still leaves millions of people not covered as the Omicron wave breaks over the country. In response, Macron's government plans to make vaccination the only way to maintain access to much of public life with a so-called vaccine pass, in quotes, introduced from January 15. 
parliamentary debate over the tightening was already acrimonious with the opposition forcing a delay in debate over the draft law late Monday. Macron's comments quickly derailed action in the chamber after it resumed late Tuesday, again suspending examination of the bill and jeopardizing the government's timetable for it to come into force. The president of the, set, of the session, Marc Lafour, said the atmosphere in the National Assembly did not offer, quote, conditions for a calm working environment, unquote. That's an understatement, to say the least. The head of the right-wing Republicans in the chamber, Damien Abad, slammed, quote, unworthy, irresponsible, and premeditated, unquote, remarks which showed, quote, childish cynicism, unquote. Meanwhile, the, the party's leader, Christian Jacob, said the group refused to endorse a text which aims to piss off the French. That was his quote. The controversy has erupted amid increasingly febrile pre-election atmosphere in France. Macron said in the interview he wants to stand for a second term in April's presidential vote, but that declaring his intentions now would distract from managing the health crisis. Opponents accuse the president of going too far with the language of his warning. Quote, it's not up to the president of the republic to pick out good and bad French people, unquote. Macron's top challenger, Republicans candidate Valérie Pécresse, told broadcaster C News. She called for a government, quote, that unites people and calms, calms things down, unquote. Macron, quote, has never let himself be the president of all French people, unquote, far-right presidential candidate Marine Le Pen charged. Far-left fire firebrand Jean-Luc Mélenchon called the vaccine pass, quote, collective punishment against individual freedom, unquote. Other critics mocked the president's claim last month that, quote, I've learned to have a lot more respect for everyone, unquote, after he previously earned a reputation for sometimes tactless comments. <laughs> a former investment banker with little experience of retail politics before sweeping into power in 2017, Macron was accused of talking down to voters in the early years of his presidency and faced a months long backlash from yellow vest protesters. That's inaccurate right there, as those yellow vest protests have been going on for years and yes. they are ongoing. They just receive no mainstream media coverage for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. But Macron's former prime minister, Edouard Philippe, told France 2 television that he backed his old boss. Quote, the president doesn't want fully vaccinated people to be subject to restrictions because eight to 10 percent of the population refuses, unquote, he said. Quote, I think there's a large majority of people who agree, unquote. Macron, who was elected in 2017 on a pledge to reform France and restore its status as a global power. <clears throat> Great reset, build back better, anybody? Is the overwhelming favorite to win the election, but analysts caution his victory is far from certain. His most potent rival could prove to be Pécresse, uh, whom they mentioned earlier in the article. So... Here we see um, evidence of more global coordination among leaders from Trudeau to Macron pushing back against the unvaccinated as the new deplorables. Um, and it's worth again pointing out that Macron is a former investment banker who ended up as the French president. Um, which seems to be par for the course for world leaders nowadays. Um, I do believe he came through the World Economic Forum, but don't quote me on that. That's something I'd have to look up. Uh, but Trudeau certainly did. He was one of the World Economic Forum's uh, young leaders. I think he was in the Young Leaders Program, which they've since rebranded to something else. Um, but these people, Macron, Trudeau, um, Morrison in Australia, uh, Schultz in Germany, uh, von der Leyen of the uh, EU, they're all on the same page. They're all, they're all, they are all part of this globalist financial class that is doing the bidding of the central bankers. And uh, the reason they're pushing back against the 
unvaccinated, uh, the reason they consider them deplorables is because they stand in the way of the agenda that those at the top want to put push through, which is what we just talked about. Um, so going from there to Australia, which is essentially the equivalent of hell on earth right now. Um, if you can pull up that daily mail piece, this is a short one. So I'll read through it as well. Um, Northern Territory forces all unvaccinated residents into lockdown and adds two more tough restrictions as COVID cases jump by 256. Uh, this was published on January 5th. Um, and if you remember, the Northern Territory of Australia is where uh, they have the so-called quarantine camps built, um, where they're uh, shipping uh primarily the unvaccinated in military vehicles, uh, healthy people, mind you, uh, for forced vaccination uh, and or quarantine. So you can see the um, highlight points there at the top. Uh, and then I'll read through this article quickly. Unvaccinated residents in the Northern Territory will be locked down for four days after the territory announced a record 256 new COVID infections overnight. From 1 p.m. on Thursday, which was yesterday, those who have not received both COVID-19 jabs can only leave home for one of three reasons, essential shopping for medical treatment, including vaccination, of course, or to provide care. Chief Minister Michael Gunner, uh, whom you'll remember was uh, the one on video about a month or so ago, just going berserk about uh, the unvaccinated and how he's lost uh, all patience for them. And that if you uh, oppose vaccine mandates in the slightest, you are unequivocally an anti-vaxxer. You can find that footage on YouTube very easily. Um, this man is off the rails. Um, I think the embodiment of the mass psychosis uh, and menticide that is occurring uh, among people of his ilk. So he said, unlike with previous lockdowns, the unvaccinated would also be banned from going outside to work or exercise. The quote lockout will last until 12 p.m. on Monday when a vaccination passport system will be introduced. Mr. Gunner has also restricted access to low vaccination communities to residents and essential workers who will need a negative rapid antigen test result before traveling. And there we have a picture of the fine gentleman. Mr. Gunner said fully vaccinated residents would not be affected by the lockdown. The Northern Territory's unvaccinated population cannot go more than 30 kilometers from their home if traveling for an essential reason unless they are going to hospital. Quote, the fully vaccinated can continue as they were, unquote, he said. Quote, for people who are not vaccinated, lockdown rules will apply to everyone aged 16 and above, unquote. Of the new cases, 27 resulted from community transmission and 10 infections are known close contacts. Another 112 remain under investigation and 107 cases are interstate and international arrivals. The territory recorded 117 new cases on Wednesday. Quote, today's escalation in case numbers is concerning, unquote, Mr. Gunner said. Quote, our community transmission rate has grown in recent days, unquote. The announcement came two days after the Northern Territories announced fully vaccinated arrivals would no longer be required to show evidence of a negative PCR test taken 72 hours before traveling to the territory. And then underneath that, I want to point out that picture of mass shoppers leaving a Coles in Darwin. Um, just look at that scene, the masked child, the masked woman. Look how miserable they look. Look how zombie-like they look. I mean, this is a picture of 
a sick society and not sick from a so-called pandemic, but from psychosis. This is what we mean when we refer to mass psychosis or as I prefer now, menticide, because I think that's much more to the point of what's happening here. And then underneath that, you see a picture of one of the quarantine facilities as they're uh, kindly calling them. This is uh, perhaps the most famous or infamous one in Howard Springs, uh, where they have uh, people who are in prison there um, vlogging about how great it is. And uh, at the same time, people are trying to escape from said facility. And then underneath, you have someone uh, who is presumably uh, vaccinated and all good to go standing out in nature. The implication there being that if you just take the poison into your body, then you will be free to enjoy nature. So continuing on, they will now be handed a rapid antigen test upon arrival in the Northern Territory so they can self-test and report the result within two hours. This is people who are considered fully vaccinated. So you still have to test. You still have to prove you're not sick, even if you've been uh, what's considered fully vaccinated. Quote, if you are in a queue down south trying to get a PCR test, leave and we will sort it out when you get here, Chief Minister Michael Gunner said on Tuesday. Yeah, I'm sure people are just flocking to the Northern Territories. Children under two years are not required to be tested. Well, that's nice. Mr. Gunner said the policy change was a response to testing issues in other states that had seen long queues, delayed result delivery, and clinics close. Quote, PCR supply and testing down south are getting thinner and thinner. They are buckling in some places. The shelves are empty of RAT, rapid antigen test kits, unquote, he said. So this is just one more glimpse into the madness of this COVID-19 insanity, um, but particularly in one of its focal points in the world, which is Australia. Um, if you look at the numbers of so-called cases, which are based on these notoriously unreliable tests, um, if you look at the numbers and compare that with the uh, government sanctioned reactions, it's, it can only be described as insanity. I see no other way to describe it. And if this is being done under the guise of Omicron, which uh, is essentially the common cold, it makes it even more insane. Uh, but this is where a lot of the world is headed. This is, this is spread from Australia to uh, much of Western Europe. Um, in the Netherlands now, um, they're about to make six shots. Somehow they've already gotten to six shots. They're about to make that uh, the standard. So this is getting crazier and crazier by the day. And it does get tiresome to keep pointing it out, to keep hearing about it. Um, but if we don't keep highlighting this, then it is going to come for all of us. And then we really will be living in hell on earth. So uh, that's some of the latest from Australia. Um, scary. Very scary. And you can see what's happening here is that these leaders, these nation state leaders, these enforcers of global governance policy from the central bankers are getting more and more aggressive in their attacks against the so-called unvaccinated. And um, not just the unvaccinated, but people um, who are disabled, people with learning disabilities, for example. <sighs> Here's so, where I get fired up, guys. <laughs> so, so we heard recently that um, individuals in the hospital uh, with Down syndrome in particular were um, being offered uh, do not resuscitate orders. Um, and uh, some of those were being uh, introduced to children without their parents present, uh, children um, who were not um, 
cognitively aware enough to even understand what they were being offered, which was that if they became unconscious, they would not be resuscitated. They would be left to die by the doctors in the hospital. Um, but I found out that this is not something new. This has been going on no. for well over a year now. And this Business Insider article, um, if you can pull up that one, this is from February of last year from, again, Business Insider. And the headline is, people with learning disabilities told they would not be resuscitated if they became ill with COVID-19, says leading charity. And that leading charity is MenCap. Um, and I'll, I will just read um, the highlight points here. People with learning disabilities are being given do not resuscitate DNR orders in England. Charity MenCap told The Guardian that many were told they would not be resuscitated if they got COVID-19. NHS figures show in the UK, 1,220 people with a learning disability have died from coronavirus since February 2020. Again, keep in mind, this is from February of last year. And despite this being brought up last year, and even before that, even in late 2020, um, and despite there being obviously intense pushback against it from parents and many others, it's still going on. It's still being reported. This is still um, a crime that's being perpetrated on uh, people with learning disabilities. If we're being honest, though, Jesse, this has been going on forever. There has always been this underlying um, kind of atmosphere of not giving a shit about people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. This is this has always been a thing. This has always been a thing. Right. And this. This adds to this idea, um, although I think it's more than an idea at this point, that certain people are being targeted to die in this global pandemic agenda. It's a calling, fam. It's it a is, calling. It is a calling. It's the elderly. It's the disabled, um, whether those are learning disabilities or physical disabilities. The poor. Uh, the poor. Uh, and if you look at what people like Bill Gates, for example, and many, many others um, in that class uh, who are doing a, the bidding again of the central bank elites believe in, they believe in depopulation. They believe in euthanasia. Um, they believe in eugenics, um, transhumanism. Uh, they want a world of lesser sur surplus humanity, which means people like you and me, which means people who are disabled, uh, whom they see as having no intrinsic life value. And it's just utterly disgusting and truly the definition of evil. Um, so I For those of you who don't know, my child is autistic. And so reading this shit, like the, the term, your blood is boiling, it doesn't even come close. It doesn't even come close to describing how that makes me feel. This makes me feel like I want to go fight people. <laughs> For real. Um, and this has been something my husband and I have talked about this at great length for a long time since this shit started. Um, and, you know, it's um, uh, it is the height of despicable. You know what I'm saying? Um, I love my disabled brothers and sisters. Um, they are not less than uh, they are every bit um, as worthy of life as you and I. Uh, and anybody who says otherwise is an absolute ghoul and should be shunned from polite society. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm really at a loss for words that me this too, because I'm so is... angry. Anything I say is going to get us kicked off YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that there are so many again on the left who are either aware of this or not aware of this, but are totally in line with the COVID-19 agenda is another 
aspect of all of this that gets the blood boiling as well. How can you be okay with this? In what right mind? It's not a right mind. It's this? um. Exactly. It's a. Uh, 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 an exceptionalist attitude. It's they're not, it, well, they're disabled. They're not as good as me. They can't contribute as much to society. It's a very capitalist attitude because people who are disabled may not be able to contribute. And that's not even legitimately true. Plenty of disabled people contribute to society a great deal. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like if you go back and look at, and this is just historically people who have, aut Albert Einstein is suspected to have aut autism. What What's fascinating is many people suspect Bill Gates has autism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but the, it, it, it's this, it's this mentality of otherization of you're different. And so therefore you're not as worthy and it's disgusting. I can't even bring myself like to wrap my brain around that, that mentality. It's just gross. It is. And I, I realized that for me, um, I cannot in any way attempt to be objective about this because I do have a child who's on the autism spectrum. So this directly impacts me like in the most personal sense possible. <laughs> you know what I'm well, saying that's my kid. I don't think, I don't think there is a way to be objective about this. No, you, you either realize the evil of it or you are you, evil you don't right you are evil you are on board with it there is no objective here uh there's no you know there are some in the bioethics field which is very ironically named who would argue that this is uh a bioethically a bioethical thing to do and that just shows you where the state of uh the field of bioethics is these days um and i encourage listeners and viewers uh to read more into the current state of bioethics because it's very disgusting it is advocate advocating for things uh such as this and uh what's cruelly ironic about this is that a lot of the uh neo-left laptop journalists people like walker bragman for oh. example whom i don't even want to waste time on but no i want to I, I want to i do want to make this point because they are constantly accusing people like me of being a right winger or a Nazi, uh, but they're fine with policies like this, which are uh, directly descended from the Nazis T4 program of mm -hmm. murdering the disabled um, who whom they saw as contributive of no worth to society. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, those people need a serious reality check, but they don't like to deal in reality because they are blanketed in so much fear. Um, it's and privilege, and, and fear and privilege and anything that has to do with what's really happening with real scientific evidence just doesn't get through to them. Um, they are the embodiment of uh, whether you want to call it mass psychosis, mass hypnosis, menticide they are the embodiment of, uh, I don't even want to call them victims of that because they're making willful decisions, mm -hmm. uh, to take the And they're intelligent they enough to know better. Mm -hmm. And going from there, if you can bring up the, uh, piece from New Zealand, um, this is another example of what the hell where this Out is going here. um this Out is from... here holy cow okay sorry it's a this... lot of pop-ups <laughs> yeah this is from the catholic herald this is from late december but it's still it hasn't gotten that much coverage uh ryan christian has covered it uk column has covered it but i haven't seen it covered anywhere else and um this is just atrocious new zealand okays euthanasia for covid patients um and uh, I won't read through the whole thing in the interest the of The first time. sentence says it all. Right. The first sentence says it all. <laughs> Patients admitted to hospital with COVID-19 can die by euthanasia if doctors decide they might not survive. The New might Zealand not survive. Has declared. So, again, you can see where um, the field of bioethics has gone completely off the rails here. Uh, and this has become a government sanctioned policy to uh, give doctors the discretion uh, of playing God, so to speak, um, with 
people's lives and it's absolutely disgusting and uh happening as we see not just in the uk but in new zealand as well which has been one of the most atrocious places with check with this regard out here guys doctors receive a government fee of a thousand dollars plus expenses for every euthanasia death they perform yep so they're getting paid to do yep. this too they're incentivized and i'll add to that that in the u.s uh there has been an incentive program, uh, especially through Medicare, through CMA, for hospitals to both um, declare and report COVID cases, and then also for um, putting people on respirators, intubating them um, in uh, COVID cases. And we know that intubation, by and large, leads to uh, those people's deaths. And there, those hospitals are paid tens of thousands of dollars to do that. Um, I would point you to the latest episode of the High Wire, Del Big Trees show. At the end of that show, um, which aired yesterday, he covered this. Uh, they get into the exact numbers that hospitals are paid um, to basically put people to death. Um, and one can only conclude from all of that that it's being done to drive up the numbers of deaths that can be attributed to COVID-19 to drive up the fear. Um, and these, a lot of these people would otherwise have survived if they were given uh, proper treatment, early treatment, like ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, we know that there are early treatments out there. Peter McCullough has just talked about this on uh, Joe Rogan's podcast, Dr. Peter McCullough. Um, Robert Malone, Dr. Robert Malone has talked about it as well, but lesser known, uh, but just as um, respectable, just as competent, uh, just as truthful doctors um, all over the world are talking about this, uh, that this does not need to happen, that this is being done for a reason. This is programmatic. And we have to realize that um, and so when you see reported that the U.S. tops one million cases in a day, um, you have to take that with not just a grain of salt, but an entire shaker, because there's so much manipulation that's being done. And that includes with the death rate as well, because things like this are happening. And as I've said, they're not just confined, confined to New Zealand or the UK. They're happening in the US and the government is paying them to do it. And the government is paying them with our tax dollars to do it. And it's truly um, disgusting because it's an attempt to make us all complicit in this calling. And uh, none of us want anything to do with any such crimes against humanity. Most of us. Most of us don't. I'm um, I'm talking about us Our here. People. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, us here right now. Um, people watching and listening. Um, Which, by the way, Shadow Ban Refugee just popped in on this topic. <laughs> he was like, "That's a hell of a thing to come in on." Sorry, Shadow Ban. Oh, <laughs> it's pretty heavy stuff. Yeah, such are the times. Yeah. So, moving from that. Um, Doctors for COVID Ethics, which is a great organization that uh, oh. includes oh, many of the doctors uh, I alluded to just now, um, besides Dr. Peter McCullough, Dr. Robert Malone. You have doctors like uh, Michael Palmer, whom you see here in the middle. Um, that's Catherine Austin Fitz on the right, uh, whom I mentioned earlier with regard to going direct and the economics aspect of this. Um, so, uh, Dr. Sucharit Bhakti from, uh, Germany, he's also involved with Doctors for COVID Ethics. And this, uh, came out on the third, um, there is, uh, there's a show out of Canada uh, Canadian independent TV journalist, um, Laura Lynn Taylor, Tom Tyler Thompson, excuse me, recently interviewed doctors for COVID ethics members, Catherine Austin Fitz and Michael Palmer on the subject of MRNA toxicity, as well as on the political and economical agenda behind the forced mass vaccinations. 
You can view the full interview, uh, which is about two hours. I just uh, dropped it in the chat, everybody. And then it goes on to say, as part of this interview, Dr. Palmer gave a presentation on mRNA vaccine toxicity, which focused on the autopsy findings from vaccine victims, which was recently published by Dr. Burkhart, who's a pathologist in Germany, and Dr. Bakhti, uh, whom I just mentioned. It's about a half hour long, and I recommend that everybody watch this. The evidence presented is damning, and you are shown uh, actual uh, images of how damaging uh, the mRNA injections are to the human biology, especially to the human immune system, uh, what what they do to just uh, a singular blood vessel. It's unbelievable. Um, and uh, Michael Palmer, uh, who's been at the forefront of attacking these uh, so-called vaccines from the beginning, does an ex excellent job in presenting this evidence. So um, if you don't have time to watch the whole uh, two hour, uh, segment, which I do recommend do watch this presentation. It's, um, you know, this is really the newest science, uh, with regard to what's going on with, uh, the danger of these injections. Um, and excuse me, sir. There was nothing about Fauci in there. Fauci science. It can't be science. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also shout out to Hunter for the tip on Rockfin. We love you. Thank you. Thank you, Hunter. Um, so please do watch this. Um, it is it is rough watching, but it's essential. Um, and uh, wherever you stand with regard to the injections, um, do watch this. This is for everybody, and everybody should know about this because there is no informed consent being given, and we have to uh, find our own informed consent, and this is one way of doing it. And... Uh, Dr. Palmer is ex excellently credentialed. Uh, he's worked with and under Dr. Sucharit Bhakti, who's also excellently credentialed. Um, of course, they've both been uh, nothing but smeared by mainstream uh, so-called medicine. Um, but please do watch this. This is, um, this is groundbreaking and really does close the case on whether or not these injections should be administered to anybody. Um, but as always watch for yourself, judge for yourself, make your own conclusions. Um, but it's there. Um, and, uh, shadow, Bud say, shadow band says we're just itching for that band hammer. Um, we don't care. We have zero Fox. <laughs> we really yeah. have zero Fox. I'm done having Fox for getting banned from YouTube or whatever. I really am just done. It's coming anyway. They're coming for us anyway. Let's not get it twisted for sure. They are, you know what I mean? So yeah. we're just going to tell the truth for as long as humanly possible. Yeah. And you can see right here, we're not presenting anything that is speculative. This is uh, medicine and science. They don't care. Done by credential professionals. <laughs> right. But YouTube doesn't care. So, it, yeah. you, you know, you could you if you actually read the terms of uh, YouTube's own terms about what you can and can't say with regard to COVID-19 on YouTube, you can potentially get banned because you're not allowed to actually say the word ivermectin, but that's in their terms. So if you read their terms and read ivermectin from their terms, then you can potentially be banned for reading their terms. That's how Here, we'll give a we'll give a like random disclaimer. We're not doctors. We're not offering medical advice. There you go. Happy yeah. now, YouTube. We're we're offering information to preserve humanity because we care about our fellow human beings and people That's... should have the right to have information and make educated decisions for themselves so stop your censorship bullshit youtube how about that yep but that's never going to happen no. and there's going to be a mass exodus from youtube i hope um but we'll see um and so just two more quick things with regard to information there's not a lot in the u.s that you can find um, with regard to the injections and um, what's been done in the ongoing trials. But if you go to, um, can you bring up the last link? The EMA one? Yeah. If you go to ema.europa.eu, uh, EMA is the uh, European Medicines Agency. And 
for some reason, they're much more forthcoming uh, with information about the injections. And uh, you can go through this for yourself and find that there is no clinical information about the safety of these injections, uh, particularly Pfizer, with regard to the immunocompromised, um, with regard to pregnant um, or lactating women, uh, with regard to taking this um, COVID-19 injection in conjunction with the flu injection, um, which is, uh, as most of you probably know, been recommended for uh, quite a few months now. There's no uh, clinical information as to the safety of that. Um, so again, to point out when doctors like Jay Bhattacharya and Martin Kuldorf um, rightly rail against lockdowns, but still say it should be somebody's choice whether or not they want to take these injections. Um, they are really doing uh, harm in saying so because they have no evidence to back that up. And I don't know if they've seen, if they've looked at the European Medicines Agency information or not, if they aren't aware of it. I am willing to bet they are. They're very smart people. Um, but they have no legs to stand on when they make uh, such statements. And there are others who have been pushing back against lockdowns and mandates um, who still say it should be somebody's choice. But in this case, I am fully against saying that anybody should uh, have... Look, everybody should have a choice, obviously, but I am not going to make the argument that, that hey, leave it up to yourself to whether or not you want to put this poison in your body. This is poison. I'm not going to recommend that anybody do this. I'm not going to recommend that anybody consider it as a choice. Um, as I've said in the past, I've suffered from the mistake of getting two of these. I will not get a third one, no matter what... Uh, weapon is brandished at me or what gun is put to my head. Um, and I recommend other people do the same. There is no need for these things. Um, and even Dr. Malone should have known that based on first principles. He knew this technology would not work. And uh, it's good that he's coming out now and speaking out against it. But uh, as Michael Palmer points out in that presentation I just referenced, um, he waited a bit too long and a lot of damage has been done. Um, but good that he's speaking out now. And again, this is not about who's pure or who's, who's more, um, right than somebody else. Uh, we're all coming to this, um, on our own terms, um, on our own timelines. And as long as we're moving in the direction of humanity, that's a good thing, but that does involve, uh, calling a spade a spade. Uh, so do take a look at this information because as I said, it's a lot more forthcoming than what you're going to find from the CDC or the FDA. Um, so the last thing I want to point out, uh, is that this week, the CDC, if you can bring up that link real quick, this is short, so I'll read through it, but this is their official media statement. Um, the CDC expands booster shot eligibility and strengthens recommendations for 12 to 17 year olds. So already boosters are being rolled out for 12 to 17 year olds. I mean, how long has it been since, uh, the so-called two dose series was, uh, approved for them. And now they're already being recommended, uh, boosters because, Omicron. So today, uh, and this was on Wednesday, January 5th, today CDC is endorsing the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, ACIP, recommendation to expand eligibility of booster doses to those 12 to 15 years old. CDC now recommends that adolescents aged 12 to 17 years old should receive a booster shot five months after their initial Pfizer-BioNTech Vac vaccination series. Uh, so 
what we see here too is that the duration of time between the second injection and the so-called booster is getting shorter which um a lot of people who've been on the ball about this have been pointing out ryan christian being one of them that initially it was six months now it's five months it's probably going to get to three months soon and then who knows after that um and another thing to point out here is that the usual process of this um, endorsement by the CDC did not happen, wherein there was a um, sort of panel that met to weigh the risks and benefits. Uh, they skipped that and just went to uh, endorsing this. So um, they really don't care about the safety effects of this anymore. Uh, and there's a lot of science we could get into showing how these boosters do not work, um, but we'll save that for another segment. So continuing on, data show that COVID-19 boosters help broaden and strengthen protection against Omicron and other SARS-CoV-2 variants. ACIP reviewed the available safety data following the administration of over 25 million vaccine doses in adolescents. COVID-19 vaccines are safe and effective. Don't forget. At this time, only the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine is authorized and recommended for adolescents age 12 to 17. The following is attributable to CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky whom most of you have probably seen on TV um, with her, uh, what somebody I heard call uh, cow eyes with that thousand yard stare just glazed over. <laughs> cow like, eyes. <laughs> like, she, like she knows she knows she's committing crimes against humanity and just has no uh, empathy Soul. for other human beings. Yeah. <laughs> So she said, quote, it is critical that we protect our children and teens from COVID-19 infection and the complications of severe disease. Today, I endorsed ACIP's vote to expand eligibility and strengthen our recommendations for booster doses. We now recommend that all adolescents aged 12 to 17 years should receive a booster shot five months after their primary series. The booster dose will provide optimized protection against COVID-19 and the Omicron variant. I encourage all parents to keep their children up to date with CDC's COVID-19 vaccine recommendations. Now, keep in mind that this age group is, especially among males, uh, that which is most prone to myocarditis, pericarditis, and other sudden cardiac events. Um, but they're now being advised to take three of these death shots uh, without any due diligence into the safety of that. And um, I don't have the quote in front of me, but I did read that essentially uh, the CDC and I believe the FDA looked at the data with regard to sudden cardiac events um, and other related um, cardiac problems that result from these injections and still maintain that um, the benefit is worth the risk despite the VAERS data, despite the fact that daily people are permanently maimed uh, or killed by these injections. Um, and despite how toxic these injections are, as you'll see if you watch Dr. Michael Palmer's presentation. So it's disgusting that this keeps being pushed out and that um, Omicron, which is akin to the common cold, is being used to justify that. But the point to take away from this, another point to take away from this is that it doesn't matter to them that Omicron is uh, more contagious but less dangerous uh, than previous variants. What matters is that they've driven the fear level up enough that people are scrambling for injections, for boosters. People are scrambling for tests. I go to the 7-Eleven down the street from my apartment and I'm just getting a coffee or 
whatever, just going in there simply with no mask on and just being a normal person, getting something normal from a normal little supermarket. And people are flocking in there with masks on. They're buying um, rapid antigen tests, uh, which are being sold over the counter, just going berserk with fear. And um, the fear has been ratcheted up so much that people are just hurting themselves right into getting more injections. And again, the injections are the gateway into the vaccine passports, are the gateway into the digital wallets, into are the gateway into being controlled by the central bank digital currencies, um, which we started with at the beginning of the show. So it doesn't matter anymore to these agencies that uh, the variant has diminished um, in its harmfulness as viruses tend to do over time. They become more contagious, but less dangerous. Exactly what we're seeing with Omicron. Um, whether this came from a strain that developed the original strain, whether that came from a lab or from nature, I think we all know by now it came from a lab um, and is man-made, but it is going through mutations the way a virus would go through mutations. And uh, despite the fact that it's really nothing to worry about, nothing to sneeze at, pun intended. The fear is ratcheted up. The, the uh, medical apartheid overlords have gotten their way and people are lining up for their boosters. And uh, that's all they care about. So fear is a powerful um, motivator. Fear is a powerful motivator and fear is um, proven to make people act irrationally. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what we're seeing. Um, I'm sure most, if not all of you watching and listening, see it around you on a daily basis. Um, but for anybody who's new, who might be watching or listening, um, take a closer look when you're out and you will see it. And um, realize that you are not the crazy one. Um, other people are going crazy. Now, that doesn't mean look down on them, think lesser of them. Um, you know, we have to try to educate people um, as gently as we can and wake them up. And that's something I used to avoid saying because it sounds very, um, there's an air of superiority to that. But in this case, the stakes are so high that it really is about waking people up because humanity is headed down a path of, um, if not extinction, then uh depopulation for sure, um, which is part of this overall agenda that we've been talking about. Um, and this here is just the next step. Uh, mind you as well that that children this age uh, have very robust immune systems and their chances of dying from COVID-19 if they do happen to come down with it are very, very small, fractionally, fr fractionally small. Um, so this is completely unnecessary, um, but it keeps going and we've got to keep paying attention to where this is going uh, for us, for the younger generations in particular, for uh, the kids now who are growing up knowing nothing but this madness, knowing nothing but being out in public with masks on uh, and, and being afraid and having uh, actual life years lost because... Uh, they're not able to see the expressions on their teachers' faces, or they're being confined to home learning because teachers now are afraid uh, to teach in person. They just canceled snack time at my partner's uh, six-year-old daughter's uh, kindergarten because the teachers are afraid that that could contribute to the spreading of oh my. Uh, Omicron. So you just see where this madness is going, this utter psychosis and... It has to stop. And part of that, you know, as tiresome as it may get, is continuing to call this stuff out, which is why I do it. Um, and uh, I won't apologize if that bothers anybody, because again, the stakes are too high here. This really is the hill that um, <laughs> we have to be willing to die on. And I will leave it at that. And to wrap up, uh, we are going to do so with something 
on a positive note. We are. I'm so excited to have like something positive that we can do. First of all, um, selfishly, I'm going to drop the GoFundMe for the April event um, for Action for Assange back in the chat. If you guys can share that, if you can donate, fantastic. If you can share it, that's awesome too. Um, I would appreciate it. We, uh, you know, got a lot of stuff we need to get done in DC. So um, there's that in the chat. But then um, to wrap up, we wanted to um, focus on something. Well, a little sad, but also positive because as you guys know, Betty White recently passed away. Um, she was fucking amazing, you guys. What a hell of a person. Um, and she was huge into, um, you know, animal rights and all of that stuff. And so her 100th birthday would have been January 17th. Um, and there is a push currently to have everybody on January 17th pick a local rescue or animal shelter in your area and donate $5. Um, I'm going to do more than that. If you can do more than that, do more than that. Um, but let's, uh, you know, send her out with the movement she deserves and let's, um, you know, donate to our local rescues um, and support animals um, as she would have wanted us to. Um, that was really her gig and she loved it. So um, I was a huge Betty White fan. She was uh, an amazing human being. Um, and so, yeah, I think that if we can, if you guys can do that, if you're able to do that, um, you know, chip in five bucks or a bags of, they love donations of bags of food, blankets, um, toys, whatever you can do. Um, contact your local animal rescue or shelter and ask them what they're in need of. They all obviously love just getting cash donations, but however you want to go about doing it, um, support your local rescue or animal shelter in Betty White's name on January 17th. Um, cause she was awesome. Yeah. And this, this has, um, a very uh this is close to my heart in a lot of ways today would have been my grandmother's 97th birthday she passed away in 2008 when she was 83 but she uh babysat my sister and me uh quite a bit uh when we were kids um because my parents were working full time and uh she also babysat us a lot on saturday nights when my parents would go out with their friends. And uh, one of the shows she watched without fail was the Golden Girls. And um, Betty White, uh, along with all of the other um, characters on that show, but particularly Betty White, uh, has been ingrained in my psyche uh, since then. And anytime I see her or hear her name, it makes me think of my grandmother, uh, whom I loved and still love very deeply. So, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a nice thing that, uh, this campaign is trying to do. And, and also my grandmother was a huge dog lover, uh, and cat lover as well, though I would say more so dogs. So I think that, um, you guys know, I love my cats. <laughs> I basically run an animal rescue, essentially. <laughs> so, yeah, if you guys can donate to an animal shelter or rescue, please do it um, yeah. for Betty. Do it for Betty. Do it for Betty or go um, even just volunteering um, that you can volunteer to like go clean cages. I know that, that some uh, shelters have like uh, story reading time to dogs because dogs love human interaction and you can go and like read books to dogs, which is amazing. Um, but even if you just if you can't donate, um, maybe just offer to volunteer for an hour or two on January 17th. Um, she was awesome. So seriously, let's give her that would be the tribute she wanted. Um, so let's give it to her, shall we? Let's do that. So Shadow Band Refugee asked, is that a Ukrainian grandmother? No, that was my uh, grandmother on my mother's side who, uh, my mother's side of the family is mostly Irish, though there's a bit of Welsh in there too. Um, so to answer your question, not my Ukrainian grandmother. I actually never got to time. meet, I actually never got to meet my Ukrainian grandmother. She, she died when my father was, uh, before he was even 10, she was going in for kidney surgery and never came out of the anesthesia. Um, this was back in the early 50s. So medicine was a lot different back then. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, a, a good heartwarming thing here with, with Betty White. And uh, a reminder too that um, not all is terrible in the world. And there are... Uh, good things that we can and should uh direct and there are good people well. good people betty white well. was a good person 
She was a good person. And so, again, I think that that's the tribute, the, the exact tribute that she would want. So I feel like we should give it to her because she gave us a lot over the years, um, you know, in terms of her activism and in terms of her craft, being an actress and a comedian and all of those things. She was so wicked funny. Um, so, yeah, let's uh, let's definitely do that for her, please. And thank you. Yep. That would make me very happy, too. So. Um, I think that about wraps us up for today, though, guys. So um, thanks for hanging out with us again on Facts on Friday. We appreciate you. We'll be back next week, as always, at 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, uh, I'm trying to think if I have. Oh, do you want to uh, uh, do you want to tell everybody what we have coming up Sunday? And yes. So Sunday, uh, I didn't cover it today. Uh, the Theranos trial, um, which just for wrapped. a reason. Yeah, for a reason. Um, because on Sunday we will have Alex Craner on the show, um, whose work we have featured on the show. So it's cool yeah, that we're going to be a few episodes back. We featured his work and he's done, uh, a really good, uh, deep dive into Theranos that goes beyond, um, the mainstream, uh, narrative and connects it to a lot of what's going on with, uh, the pandemic madness now. Uh, so that'll be interesting. That's at noon uh, Eastern time on Sunday. And uh, we're very much looking forward to that. Uh, so do tune in if you can. And just so everybody knows, we are not doing a free Assange vigil tonight. Again, I already mentioned it once this show, but um, as some of you may already know, Andrew's taking a break from the vigil and from a fray. Um, so I have a new co-host. Um, his name is Eric, but we're he just had his first show on Tuesday. So we're kind of like slowing ourselves into it. Um, so we're going to take the weekend off. Um, and then next week, we're coming in swinging with two shows um, on Tuesday and Friday. On Tuesday, um, we have Alex Rubenstein. Um, and then on Friday, we have um, Addy Ads, who you guys probably know from his on the ground work on the Maxwell trial. Um, so I'm really excited to have both of them on. Um, we're going back to two uh, shows a week, Tuesdays and Fridays. Um, so no show tonight, but then we'll be back on Tuesday, January 11th, which is also the day before my birthday. Woo -woo! So um, yeah. yeah, so How we'll see you guys. Be? 40. It's my big yeah. 40, you guys. <laughs> my big 40 can you believe it i'm a grown-up it's weird <laughs> um okay is so that yeah still, is that still over the hill i don't know is it ah that know. used to be the expression i heard, I heard 40s the new 30 that's what somebody told me last week so whatever okay. that means i don't even know what that means but okay all i know is i'm 40 age doesn't bother me um no. not at all the Shouldn't. alternative is death so i'll take it <laughs> yeah um all right, so we'll see you guys on Sunday at noon um, to talk Theranos. Uh, should be an interesting show. Definitely don't miss out on that. Um, I'm going to create a link for that as soon as I leave here, and then I'll tweet it so everybody can uh, do the whole set an alert thing on your YouTube or whatever. Um, so, yeah, we will see you guys Sunday. Thanks, to everybody, for joining us. We love you so much, and you we'll see all. you soon. Bye, guys.